We're continuing with where we start, uh, started last week, uh, left last week with Bibles of the Reformation. And one of the core uh, ways in which God used the Reformation, I guess you could also say one of the things that was the a catalyst for the Reformation had to do with the Word of God. And that's probably one of the greatest things that came out of the Reformation was uh, the increased translation and distribution of the Word of God because there were people who uh, wanted the common people to be able to read God's Word, understand God's Word, as opposed to having a hierarchy saying, you don't need God's Word, we just will tell you what it means. You go by our tradition, the church fathers have already determined uh, what it means, and so you don't need to really look in the Bible for yourself. And that was, so, so you had those two trains of thought, and so on the side of those who were involved during this Reformation period, uh, they had the idea, we want, to, we want to get the Bible into more people's hands. And so last, uh, last week we looked at the, uh, the Greek New Testament, uh, and this week we'll look at the French Bible during this Reformation period. Uh, and the, the first French Bible of the Reformation was by Jacques Lefebvre. And while he, he was a, uh, and you see the years there that he lived, he was a professor at the Unity, uh, University of Paris and was saved later in life. Uh, the, the story goes uh, about him while collecting the legends of the Catholic saints with a plan to publish them in chronological order. Uh, he became disgusted with the fictitious and ridiculous nature of the accounts and began to study the scriptures instead. He said, quote, he's quoted as saying, It is God alone who by his grace through faith justifies unto everlasting life. There is a righteousness of works, there is a righteousness of grace, the one coming from man, the other from God. One is earthly and passes away, the other is heavenly and eternal. One is the shadow in the sign the other the light and the truth. One makes it known to us that we may escape death, the other reveals grace that we may obtain life. His translation of the four Gospels was completed in 1522, followed by the New Testament in 1523 and the complete Bible in 1528. And his Bible, as many of the Reformation Bibles, uh, he it was... <laughs> It was well received by the common people, but hated by the Catholic Church. Uh, they did not like the idea, oh, here's more people getting their hands on God's Word. And, this, and the other thing was, this was not a translation that they, could, that they controlled. So they wanted the control of the Bible. They took claim to the Bible. They, and the Catholic Church believes that they are the ones that were basically the originator of the Bible. The Bible came from the Catholic Church. So the Bible, the Catholic Church has claims uh, to the Bible and what it means. That's, that's what they believe. But uh, the, the Sorbonne, the theological faculty of the University of Paris, condemned Lefebvre as a heretic, and he had to flee the city. Beginning in 1525, many Christians were burned alive in France, and in 1535, the Sorbonne obtained an order from the king to forbid all printing. And, you know, un unfortunately, we got to remember that um, even though this is something from hundreds of years in the past, there are elements of that, there's that spirit that still lives of the people that if they disagree or they hate something, their answer is to try to use power to just suppress it and, and stomp it out. And uh, that, that goes on today in a lot of ways, actually it really is increasing. Now it's not the, so much the literal printing of books, although perhaps some, from time to time that does happen, but we see uh, the control of what, uh, uh, trying to stamp out what people publish even online. Uh, and of course there's, you know, the, the internet is a, is a, a minefield of, uh, of, of challenges and risk anyway of whether you're getting the truth or error, but the whole point is, is to let, uh, let people themselves decide what they're going to believe rather than having some hierarchy, uh, whether it's, in this case it was the Catholic Church, but in, in the modern day cases of whether it's uh, government or uh, large corporate, whatever the, the issues might be, deciding what well, we're going to determine what you can believe and not believe. Um, so we, need to, we do need to be discerning in this day and age because 
if uh, back then it was harder to publish your thoughts. <laughs> so you better, you better be sure of what you're saying. <laughs> it doesn't mean it was all true, uh, but you better be sure what you're saying because you got to go to a bit more effort to uh, publish your thoughts. Now today, unfortunately, knowledge has been cheapened because of just how much is out there and a lot of it being untrue or, or mis, misguided or, or whatever the case might be. But think about that, for obtaining an order from the king to forbid all printing, that they just say, nope, nope, no more printing, no more printing, because we gotta, we gotta stop the printing of this Bible. And uh, so there's the importance of publishing and importance of publishing good material, because you don't always know how long you're gonna have it or be able to have it. And we're, I mean, we're spoiled here because, I mean, you can just publish things really easily. Uh, whether it's online or whether it's uh, through books, you know, independent publishing. I mean, pretty much, uh, it's it's not hard. But uh, there's a lot. Um, but so we need to be thankful for that and and not take that for granted. Did you have something about? Oh right, right. Right. So it's the same mindset. Yeah. Yeah. You don't publish it anymore? Right, right. So what's the next step after that? Oh, yeah. And, and you know, and the challenging part is, um, you know, apparently with Dr. Seuss, now I'm not a big fan of Dr. Seuss to begin with, um, but apparently, and I haven't looked, but my wife does say there are some, he was fairly uh, stereotypical and, would you say, racist in his, uh, you mentioned some, he was very opinionated. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing, and yes, exactly. That well, that's exactly right, and um, yeah, and 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 yeah, it's a matter of trusting that people are going to make the right choices as far as what they look at. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of confidence in society at large to make the right choices is what they're going to read. But, but, and, and in this, in the case of Dr. Seuss, it was the actual. Dr. Seuss Foundation or whatever it is that decided they're not going to publish those. So it wasn't, but it started with an ex, I think it started more with an external controversy. And then they decided the, uh, they decided to, uh, okay, we're just going to leave certain uh, books out. But been a hero for years. yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was the same. Oh, yeah, no, it, it is. That's, and that's an example of it um, because. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's it's the same. It's the same mindset as the book burning mentality, um, and we we got to get rid of these things. And and so and that's the problem is whether or not and you know for example with Dr. Seuss okay his opinions his stereotypes or whatever he put into his books and um, some of his books apparently. Uh, it's it's a matter of there are people who might recognize the problems and they might share their opinions saying well be careful about Dr. Seuss books because they contain X Y and Z it's another thing to then go on an all-out rampage like we've got to purge things from society and now you might even sometimes agree with what needs to be purged from society but the problem is that purging can turn around and come back to you pretty quick to to the things that are right and uh, so, so it's very important to keep that in perspective. Media. What's that? Twitter. Oh yeah, shut yeah. Down oh yeah, just shut down somebody, and 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 you know. And then there's the there is the uh, contra there's the the argument back and forth saying, well, these are private companies, and then the other side says, well, this is the public square of today. So there's different arguments as to Twitter and Facebook, social media. Um, uh, one preacher said one time he he. He preached a message. He was actually, uh, he was, I think this might have been during a missions conference. He was talking about the dangers of Facebook because he had known personally many pastors' ministries who had been ruined because of Facebook, because of gossip and, and lies on Facebook about them. And once, once people latch onto that, then it spreads and, and it just it ruins their ministry. And, uh, and he, he commented that Facebook is the world's largest sewage system. So. <laughs> And, uh, and there's, there's some truth to that because uh, I, 
The only reason I got on Facebook to begin with was I wanted the church to have a Facebook page. The problem is it doesn't stay updated, so <laughs> sometimes I wonder if it's worth it. The other thing is I found it is nice. There's certain relatives. We get to see some pictures, and there's various ways of keeping in contact. So in that regard, there are some beneficial uses, but overall, a lot of it today is if, if Facebook's suppressing the speech, then just stop using it. If you're upset with Facebook, just, just with Twitter, just stop using it. It's not a fundamental human right to be able to use Facebook or Twitter. And, uh, and if people just stopped using Facebook, they would, they would uh, either go out of business or change their ways pretty quick. So, because their, their, their money comes from advertising revenue, but um, most of Facebook's money does. And, um, but uh, anyway, it's, but it's the same, the same mi mindset is still alive. Human nature doesn't change. And uh, so we need to recognize there's a difference between promoting the truth and warning about error. I mean, there may be some books out there that are, you warn about error, saying these, these are dangerous books. It's another thing to have a purging mentality of saying, I need to, to we need to add mo kind of the, the mob uh, and purge things from society. Because the fact is, if there's enough people who believe the truth and actually have discernment and wisdom, they're not going to read the stuff anyway. And so it comes back to the, the spiritual condition of a, of a society. And, uh, and we see that today in, in negative ways of, of what people are taking in. But, they, uh, but the Bible was, was under assault. Um, uh, you know, and, and speaking of printing the Bible, there's a, there's a ministry in Michigan that uh, is involved in printing Bibles. And the, the, the whole idea behind that, and they print very nice. Actually, this, this uh, Bible came from that uh, ministry. Very nice Bible, high-quality Bibles. And, you, you know, they're probably better quality than even Cambridge Bibles, but they're pretty much half the price. Um, and, uh, and their whole their, their mindset, their whole reason for doing it is they believe, and as we're looking here, they believe that it was the churches who had the responsibility to publish God's Word. It was the Christians, not these... Uh, worldly, ungodly, secular publishing houses that when you're buying their Bible, I'm not saying it's wrong to buy a Thomas Nelson Bible or a Zondervan branded, branded Bible, a published Bible. I'm just saying these are, just realize this, these, are, these are companies that are owned, but they put out the, the greatest amount of filth and here they are publishing God's word. Do we really want the control of the Bible to be in their hands? And so their, um, their, that's, that's her whole idea is quality, they're not trying to make a bunch of money off of it, um, but just getting the Bible into people's hands. And, um, and sometimes you need to get the cheaper Bible, you know. Um, you know, then you buy the, whatever the publisher might be. There's various publishers. But, um, but at the same time, they was, it's, it's from the mindset that these are, uh, it's, it's, it's our job. It's our job as Christians. It's the church's job to be publishing God's Word. And, and they, so there's a, I don't know, a few a network set up. I don't know exactly where the Bibles themselves are printed and bound, but they're distributed uh, from a place in Michigan, from a church in Michigan. But, but that's, that's the mentality. It's the same mentality back in this era is, yes, we got to get the Word of God out to people, and uh, just they need to have access to it. Um, it's also actually our pew Bibles are from the same place, and our gift Bibles that we have are from the same place. So they have some cheaper options, those gift Bibles that we have, and then the, the pew Bibles. So good quality things, and we're not supporting the ungodly uh, publishing companies that put out all kinds of other stuff. Um, because Thomas Nelson and Zondervan, those are the biggest ones. Thomas Nelson was bought by HarperCollins, which owns Zondervan, and HarperCollins is owned by News Corporation, which is responsible for all kinds of smutty tabloids and all kinds of things. So anyway, just a, just a little food for thought there. It's not saying if you buy every Thomas Nelson Bible, don't throw it away or anything, but uh, <laughs> I'm just, just, just for your information. But the idea is that you know, I, I like to support as much as I can those that uh, are fellow Christians, fellow believers in their publishing of God's Word, because... Who knows what's going to happen in the future? They might brand, oh, the Bible all of a sudden is a hate book. So, oh, uh, they would not, they, eventually, who knows? They, they say, well, we better stop printing the Bible because it's a, it's a hate book. It's a hate book. We better not do that anymore. So we better make sure we have um, the, uh, 
we better, better make sure we've, we've got God's Word. We've got plenty of copies of God's Word, thankfully. But think about back at this time, they didn't have the, the access to God's Word. And so this, this was monumental, what was going on back here at this time, the translation in these different languages, and here, the, the, uh, the French. Uh, Lefebvre was protected until the end of his life by Queen Margaret. She was the sister of King Francis I of France and the wife of Henry de Albret, the King of Navarre. She was converted in 1521 through reading the Greek New Testament and through conversations with Bible-believing Christians. Uh, Lefebvre sent her a copy of his New Testament and when it was first, uh, when it was first published. Queen Margaret protected many persecuted saints in her little kingdom in Lower Navarre and Bern in the Pyrenees Mountains during the days when persecution raged in France and Spain. Uh, many entire refugee families settled there. After Margaret's death, her daughter, Jean de Albret, uh, continued to oversee this little bastion of religious liberty. But um, eventually the Catholic Church catches up with you. Uh, and in 1617, King Louis XIII used military force to require the inhabitants of Bern to return to Romanism. The army broke open churches, burned Protestant books and Bibles, and killed and imprisoned those who refused to kneel before the Catholic host. This was instigated by the Catholic authorities with funding from the Pope. Uh, in 1545, there were general persecutions against the Waldenses in France. In uh, 1546, the Catholic authorities issued a decree against Lefebvre and his Bible. It's, they said, uh, Beer, according to Beardsley in the Bible Among the Nations, they, it said, it is neither expedient nor useful for the Christian public that any translation of the Bible should be permitted to be printed, but that they ought to be suppressed as injurious. And so they... Uh, they're, they're thinking, this is a bad thing for the public. This is a bad thing for society. We don't want this Bible out there. Why? Because it was a threat to their control, to their false doctrine. The persecution in France forced many Bible believers into exile. Some settled in Basel, Switzerland, and established printing operations to publish scriptures and evangelistic and Bible study materials for the French people. Lefebvre's New Testament was revised and republished, and it was distributed from house to to the house, village to village. Uh, those who dared to carry the Bible into France faced death. In 1546, Peter Chepot was burned to death for selling French Bibles. Because of his bold testimony at the place of persecution, a decree was made that all which were to be burned unless they recanted at the fire, this is according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, should have their tongues cut off, which law diligently afterward was observed. Stephen Pauliot was also arrested in 1546 with a bag of scriptures and gospel books he was distributing. Uh, and they did what they said they would do, uh, and he was burned. Uh, his, his, his satchel book, uh, books hanging about his neck. Nicholas Nail, a shoemaker, was arrested in Paris in 1553 when he brought parcels of books to distribute among the believers. He was burned soon after his arrest. In 1554, Dionysius Vare who had smuggled many books into France, was arrested in Normandy. He was sentenced to be, quote, burned alive and thrice lifted up and let down again into the fire. Uh, Bartholomew Hector, who made his living selling books, was arrested in 1556 and burned at Thurin. Uh, edicts against the French Bible believers were issued in 1549 and 1551. Inquisitors general were appointed in 1557. Persecution followed for hundreds of years, and it even extended uh, to the days of Napoleon. Uh, Catholic authorities in France were persecuting Protestants and other Bible believers. A decree dated October 31, 1854, forbade all religious meetings, and the Christians were forced to congregate secretly in the forests and fields. Robert Olivetan uh, was another translator of the French Bible. He received the doctrine of justification by faith while studying in Paris and then convinced his cousin, John Calvin, of this doctrine. After he studied Hebrew and Greek in Strasbourg, France, in 1532, he journeyed to northern Italy and met with the Waldenses. Uh, the Olive Tan Bible was published in 1535 with the money collected from Waldensian churches. Uh, they, had, they actually held an assembly and determined to fund the printing of a French Bible. 
Uh, Olive Ten died in Italy three years later. Theodore Beza and others revised Olive Ten's Bible and republished it in 1588. And we talked about uh, him last week. Uh, it was revised by uh, the Olive Ten Bible in its various forms became the Bible of French believers for 350 years. It was revised by David Martin between 1696 and 1707. Uh, he had been forced to flee from France due to persecution, and he was later the pastor of the Walloon Church at Utrecht in Holland. It was revised in 1744 by Frederick Osterwald, a Swiss pastor, and again in 1869 by Charles Frossard, a pastor. In 1881, the Bible Society of France issued a version of the complete Oliveton Bible called the Frossard Edition of the Ostervold Bible. And interestingly enough, uh, the Ostervold Bible is now back in print because of some French-speaking independent Baptists. Uh, it was uh, republished, I believe it was completed in eight, uh, uh, 2018. Now, I was, <laughs> I was encouraged by that, but then I was saddened when I found out who actually was behind it because he was a, seemed to be a solid guy and ended up, I think he was lifted up in pride and got into some major trouble uh, there in, in Quebec, actually. He was a pastor in Quebec, and some major things happened there with him, which was saddening to me, and I found out he's actually the one who uh, was heading this up. Um, so sad to say that, but happy to say that there is, uh, that that was actually, there was a lot of work put into uh, getting that back into print uh, because of some French-speaking believers. And, um, and once again, it just shows, it goes on. That there are people who love God's Word and want God's Word to be in the hands of people who can read it. And, uh, you know, for example, in this case, uh, French-speaking people, and we know that the... Uh, I mean, the French-speaking people need, they need God's Word in their life. They need God's Word in their life, whether it's in France or whether it's in, in Quebec and other places in the world. Uh, great, a great, great need of, of God's Word um, and uh, being distributed. So we're going to stop there with, uh, with the French Bible, and we'll pick up with another one next week, uh, Lord willing. And uh, any questions, comments, anything... Uh, Yes. I think because of the persecution and everything else, France right now, it's uh, basically the churches in France are empty. Yeah. They, they don't go to church anymore. Right. That's it. And I think the Muslim population is going to overtake the so-called Christians. Definitely. If they didn't, it will be very soon. Definitely. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, France is in big trouble spiritually. Um, big trouble spiritually. We There was a... Uh, when we were in Michigan, there was a missionary who had been, uh, he had been in France for a number of years, and he, had, he was speaking at the church there we were in in Michigan. And he said, uh, and uh, witchcraft is really big in, in France, uh, the occult. Um, and he, what he said was, the, the witch doctors, or whatever they're called over there, they would do things like uh, Catholic tradition, Catholic rites and things like that. And then the Catholic priests, they would do the occultic type of things. Like there was a, a combining of what they actually were doing. Uh, and that, that was his testimony. That's what he said at the time. And he, had, he was over there. He was, had a hand in, in um, trying to start churches there. And, uh, but it's, it's a really dark place spiritually. And uh, what brings light to a place is the Word of God. And it's interesting, the places that had the, in this case, you said the persecution, there the light suppressed, that the, just the Christians had to flee, they were driven out, they were, the, the Bible was suppressed. Uh, those places did not turn out well spiritually when the, when the Christians left and they just got driven out. And there's a lot of darkness there. Uh, and when, then when you look at a place like Great Britain, uh, they had a bit more light for a bit longer period of time but the problem is now they are turning in a lot of ways. The good thing is there still are a number of Christians over there, uh, so maybe they're in a little better shape. But when a, when a nation rejects God's word, rejects the Lord, Jesus Christ, uh, then it's, it's not going to turn out well. Um, and we're seeing, you see that in Europe, just a, dark, a lot of dark places in Europe. Um, you see that even to a certain degree in Canada, not as free and... Not as much light there as in 
uh, in America. Uh, so while we have this here in America, uh, we need to take full advantage of what we have. And unfortunately, the thing that grieves me the most is that, yes, there are many, many church buildings, but even the ones who would consider themselves Bible-preaching churches, a lot of the more contemporary-shaped churches, um, are more kind of sitting back, hey, let's enjoy life, let's, uh, let's not, they, they don't really take it seriously. And, and I think the devil is, is using some things to, to water it down, water, try to water Christianity down in America. You know, if you can't stomp it out and you can't suppress it, let's at least dilute it. And uh, what we need are more Christians who are completely dedicated to the Word of God, to God's, um, to the message, to the mission, to uh, uh, preaching the gospel, to growing, to taking things seriously, to living a life that's pleasing to the Lord.